In this PowerPoint podcast, I would like to share some extra information with you regarding the so-called impingement syndrome, or should we say subacromial pain syndrome instead? Well, remember, when you watched the films on the basic examination of the shoulder and the films on rotator cuff, then of course we talked about impingement. But actually, impingement is not a diagnosis. Impingement is just a statement. Something, something is squeezed in somewhere in the shoulder, mostly between humerus and acromion. What exactly is impinged? Well, when you interpret your basic examination in an optimal way and some accessory tests, then yes, sometimes we can find out which structure or which part of the structure is temporarily squeezed in. Yes. But is impingement a structural problem? Is it all about the structure? Actually, no. Well, we can make a diagnosis but you can ask yourself the question why is supraspinatus tenoperiostal impinged or infraspinatus or the subdeltoid bursa actually in many cases there is rather a functional problem than a real structural problem there's a biomechanical problem actually the kinematics in the shoulder seem to play a big role is there a movement problem in the shoulder? This is an important question. And perhaps because of changed kinematics, perhaps that could be the reason for which, for instance, a supraspinatus or any other structure gets impinged. So keep that in mind. So that's why we don't like to use the word impingement too much subacromial pain syndrome would indeed be a better label. But remember, never, never forget to perform a good basic functional examination so that you can identify different patterns, different clinical patterns. And this, this, this is still a problem because I notice <clears throat> that Many people, very often, they just rely on one or two positive tests. And in many cases, those tests are also some accessory tests. Well, that doesn't seem to be very reliable. Uh, when we examine a patient and when we try to come to a conclusion, it is super important that we focus on clusters of positive tests and clusters of negative tests. This is, in fact, a general rule in basic orthopedic medicine. So keep that in mind. But in this PowerPoint podcast, I'm also going to show you some, some accessory tests which could be very interesting in relation to subacromial pain syndrome. But another question we have to ask ourselves is the following. Is the pain of the patient, is that related to some structural or mechanical problem? Or is it more related to central sensitization? Because this is something we see once in a while in shoulder patients, but also in lumbar spine patients. Well, regarding central sensitization, I uh, gladly refer to one of the other films I produced, which are going to be on the online masterclass. Another thing <clears throat> which is important um, to, to map, so to speak, is how irritated is the patient's shoulder. And remember, if you watched the basic films on examination procedure, the basic examination procedure, and if you watch the films on diagnosis of arthritis, then, then you already know what I'm going to say now. But we can determine, let's say, the severity of the problem, the stage of the problem, the irritability of the shoulder, based on three questions from the history. Do you have pain at rest? Can you lie on that side? And is there any radiation of pain below the elbow? 
What do we do with those questions? Well, imagine you hear three favorable answers. There is no pain at rest, I can lie on that side, and there is no radiation below the elbow. Well, in that case, that would be a slightly irritated shoulder. We call that a stage one. Let's imagine you get three unfavorable answers. Yes, I have pain at rest. No, I can't lie on that side. And yes, there is more pain, uh, radiation of pain that goes further than the elbow. Well, then you have a highly irritated shoulder, which we call stage three. Any combination of favorable and unfavorable answers is a stage two. When we apply this logic to arthritis, then when you watch the films of the arthritis diagnosis and treatment strategy, then you know that the treatment strategy of a stage one arthritis is totally different than the treatment strategy of a stage three. So that's important to realize. We can also find an extra thing from the functional examination. We do our passive tests and let's imagine you do a passive movement and first you provoke pain, pain and you go further and further and you provoke pain, pain, pain and then the patient says no, 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 stop, that's enough. This is highly irritated. Pain before the end of the movement. If you reverse the situation, you do the passive movement you go to the end of the movement and then you give a slight overpressure and then you're going to provoke end range pain. This is a slightly irritated shoulder. And another thing to keep in mind, is there any fear avoidance for movement during the functional examination? We not only see that very often with shoulder patients, but we also see that for instance, with lumbar spine patients. So it is quite important to, let's say, motivate the patient during the passive and active and resisted movement testing. Yeah. Okay. In literature, you find also some other elements to, to help you to differentiate the irritability or the stage of irritability of the shoulder. Well, as you can see over here on the slide, the difference between highly irritated and lowly irritated is very clear. Yeah? Highly irritated, you have a vascor, a pain of more than 7 out of 10. Low irritation, less than 3 out of 10. A high irritation, you have constant pain, constant pain at night or pain at rest. Whereas the low irritated shoulder has intermittent pain. And as I pointed out before, when you do the passive movement testing with the highly irritated shoulder, you have pain, 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 pain during movement and then the limitation of movement. With the low irritated shoulder, there you can first go to the end of the movement and then you provoke pain. Highly irritated, we also see that uh, the active range of motion is more limited than the passive range of motion. With the low irritated shoulder, this is more or less equal. And of course, the functional disability between yeah, the two different patients is also different. That's logical. You have a much higher functional disability when you have a high stage of irritability. Okay. Remember the basic examination procedure we did. Yeah. We did some active tests, some passive tests, some resisted tests, and if necessary, also some accessory tests. But as I told you earlier, I'm going to talk more about some accessory tests in a few minutes. Um, Professor Coles, who is an authority on uh, shoulder diagnosis and shoulder treatment, uh, she is suggesting to, to classify shoulder tests in the following way. You have four groups of tests. 
And we are already familiar, those of you who already did a basic training program in, in modern orthopedic medicine, you are familiar with the symptom provocation test, you are familiar with the symptom reduction test, and you are familiar with the tissue flexibility test, which are the normal, let's say, passive tests. You're familiar with that. But keep in mind, whenever you do some tests, Never ask to the patient, does it hurt? Because when you watch the films on the basic clinical reasoning principles, then in those films I explain you in detail why this is not a good question. Yeah. If you ask this question on a test, then you have a very high probability to reach a wrong diagnosis. So we don't ask, does it hurt? But instead we ask, does that change anything? And then the patient has three options. The patient can say, no, it doesn't change anything. Or, it hurts more. Or, it hurts less. But if the patient says, it hurts more, don't automatically assume that it hurts more on the same location as where he described his pain before. Now, it's quite possible that during a certain test, you provoke some pain somewhere else. So this is something you have to interpret because this could have important diagnostic consequences. And then a fourth group of tests is added, the tissue failure test. And those are, those are active tests. We ask the patient to perform a movement, for instance, uh, an internal rotation movement in the shoulder, yeah? put your hand behind your back. And here again, we don't ask, does it hurt? But we also don't ask, does that change anything? Uh, actually, we just ask, can you do that? Is that possible or not? So the question is, is the structure capable of performing its function? This is, let's say, this is the only, the only purpose of this test or this way of testing. Well, um, let me show you some, some extra tests, specifically uh, in relation to subacromial pain syndrome. For instance, the near test. Yeah. The therapist is pushing the scapula down, we incorporate internal rotation in the shoulder, and then we move passively to anterior elevation. Well, when you provoke anterior shoulder pain on this test, then yeah, we think of some kind of suprachromial impingement. But if you provoke posterior pain, then you think more of an internal impingement, more specifically in the glenohumeral joint. So that's perhaps, that's perhaps interesting to differentiate. Other tests are the empty can test and the full can test, or empty can test is also called the Jobs test. Well, where uh, the empty can test, okay, this is thumbs down and the full can test is thumbs up and you ask the patient to push upwards in both versions. But then the question is, how do you interpret this kind of test? Well. Of course, both of them are impingement tests. But if the empty can test is positive and the full can test is negative, then the impingement is mostly not related to rotator cuff muscles. If the full can test is positive, then we think more of supraspinatus. But also compare that with the regular resisted abduction test from the standard position. And perhaps also compare that with your resisted abduction test from a lying position. Yeah? Because remember, if we want to make a differential diagnosis between on the one hand a contractile structure and on the other hand an inert structure, for instance the bursa, then we're going to see that there is a difference in answer on the resisted test when you change the position. Yeah? But I refer uh, for more information on that specific clinical reasoning part, I refer to the films on bursitis, which are also 
on this platform, of course. Another test is the Hawkins-Kennedy test. Yeah, you support the patient's arm and then you give a nice provocation into internal rotation. And if this test is positive, yes, this is another indication for a subacromial impingement and not for an internal impingement. In other words, not glenohumeral. Okay. And then there's another test, the so-called relocation test. Remember that as an accessory test, we did the anterior apprehension test. The patient was standing and we incorporated the same position as you see now the patient in lying. But the purpose was to provoke some instability feeling. Of course, this test can also be positive uh, if there is some kind of impingement. And what do we do now? Well, the patient, we do it in lying. The patient is in lying. And first, you just do it from, let's say, in the normal way. Yeah, you just go to the end of a movement and you provoke. Yeah. But then you repeat the test and you add a posterior glide in the humeral, the glenohumeral joint. And this is interesting because then you can start to compare the two, the two versions. This relocation test is considered to be positive if the pain diminishes during the test. So that means that any impingement is secondary. That the pain is more elicted from excessive anterior translation of the humeral head. Ah, that's interesting. Remember what I said before? The kinematics in the shoulder could play an important role. The test is negative if the pain simply persists, if there is no difference between the basic version and the version with posterior pressure. So that gives an indication of a primary impingement and most likely the symptoms are not dependent on the position of the humerus. There are some more tests. The O'Brien's test, well you can do that in two ways. You can do that with thumb down and thumb up. So you go to anterior elevation, some adduction and then thumbs down or thumbs up and the patient is asked to push with his arm down. And how can you interpret those tests? Well, it's very simple. Um, this is interesting if you suspect a labral tear. And in that case, the test is going to be more painful when we do it with the version thumbs down. Okay? During active elevation, we can also ask to do or to perform this active elevation with, let's say, a scapula-assisted elevation. Yeah? So we guide manually the movement of the scapula. And perhaps it's interesting to compare this version with just a normal version from the basic examination without our manual help. Perhaps Perhaps, if the patient has a painful arc, perhaps it could be related to some scapular dyskinesis. But let's put a question mark behind that. This is not an absolute certainty. Well, following shoulder pain clinical reasoning algorithm has been uh, proposed by uh, Professor Coles. The difference between a suprachromial conflict versus a glenohumeral or internal conflict. Well, this difference is pretty clear. And the suprachromial conflict, the YOP test, is positive. Glenohumeral, the JOP test, is negative. Suprachromial, Hawkins is positive. Glenohumeral, Hawkins is negative. Suprachromial, the near test provokes anterior pain. And the internal conflict, the near test is provoking posterior pain. So I think, I think if you, if you suspect kind of suprachromial pain syndrome, 
and you finished your basic examination, then it's quite interesting to also add those tests to it. But as I told you before, never forget your basic examination. And then the clinical reasoning algorithm continues. When you think of a subacromial conflict, well, it could be a primary structured-based problem, or it could be a secondary function-based problem. Primary structure-based, for instance, uh, contractile structure, uh, bursa, those things. Well, in that case, the apprehension test is positive, but the relocation test, remember, the version in lying, is negative. When there is a secondary function-based test, then, of course, your apprehension test is positive, but the relocation test is also positive, as I described earlier. So that's also, that's also interesting to realize. Well, the um, algorithm goes further and further in detail, but I would like to suggest that we go back to our basic clinical reasoning algorithm, which we use in, in orthopedic medicine. The four questions which are so important. The patient is presenting some symptoms. The question is, is it a local problem or is it a referred problem? Is that a shoulder problem or is it referred, for instance, from the cervical spine? Of course, you're going to find an answer to that question um, by doing a good history taking of the patient. Then we do our basic functional examination, perhaps with some accessory test, and we ask ourselves the question, did we see a contractile structure and or an inert structure problem? And if there is an inert problem, remember, what did we see? Which pattern did we see? Capsular problem or a non-capsular problem? Were we able to define, or to define a structure at fault? If yes, do we know where exactly in this structure is the problem? Question mark? Well, I think it's very interesting to, to, to follow this algorithm at all times, and then you can add you can add some pieces of the algorithm I just illustrated to you before. But more on the basic clinical reasoning algorithm, well, uh, you find all the details in the films I made on the clinical reasoning process. But I honestly think that the combination, the combination of this thinking incorporating the value of those extra tests, combination with your basic clinical reasoning procedure, well, I think that's very, very interesting. And as I told you before, well, one positive test, that doesn't mean anything. If you, if you find a positive uh, empty can test, you find a Hawkins test, a uh, near test, whatever, that doesn't mean anything. Actually, if you want to come to the conclusion, to, let's say a reliable conclusion that there is a subacromial conflict, then we need a cluster of best tests. And those are the things I would like uh, to conclude this uh, PowerPoint podcast with. There is a painful arc. The patient has pain on resisted lateral rotation, near test, Hawkins test, and the empty can test or Job's test. If three out of five, three out of five are positive, then that seems to be quite reliable to come to the conclusion there is a subacromial conflict. And as pointed out before, okay, we can define a structure, perhaps we can treat the structure, but we may also not forget the biomechanical aspect, yeah, the kinematics of the shoulder. So three out of five. To conclude, whatever test you do, when we focus on symptom reduction tests, symptom reduction tests seem to have a higher validity, are more interesting than just symptom provocation tests. So, so far, so good.